All right, good morning, everyone. Everybody had a, a rough week, and so uh, we can end the week by or start the week, whichever you want, uh, here in church this morning, which is where we all need to be at. Uh, uh, Buckhorn's seniors, I just want to say they're out in California. I'm without my better half this weekend. It gets a little lonely. So I was thinking... Uh, I understand what she went through when I was laid up in the hospital for three months. So, just pray that they have a uh, a safe trip out there. It's uh, tough when you got kids with you. So, uh, I want to welcome everyone, everybody on Facebook. So, anybody got a, a prayer request by upraised hand, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer and start service. <clears throat> Lord, we want to thank you for another day of life. We want to thank you for everyone's made effort to be here this morning. Just, I don't know all the requests, Lord, but you do. And just have your way in each and every need that is in this building. Just be with the preaching uh, as Brother B brings the message and be with the singing. In your name we pray. Amen. Are you thankful to be in God's house today? We're, we're looking around seeing all your smiling faces. Well, most of your smiling faces. Uh, and it's just good to be in God's house. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And I'm so thankful because of Jesus that I can be a child of God today. Amen? And that's what this song talks about. Sing it with us.
my God, if I tried to recite all of your wonderful deeds, I would never, never come to the end of them. He is the God of wonders.
can ever come close. No thing can compare to our living home. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, your presence, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the and he is worthy to be praised. Amen? Leviticus 19 and 2 tells us, You shall be holy for the Lord your God, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And uh, it is good to be again in God's house, and we uh, want to say thank you to everyone that pitched in and helped and was here uh, for our weekend Easter weekend services and egg hunt and all of that. What a blessing it was, amen? And uh, we're thankful for that. And uh, for those of you that may be wondering, the uh, combined sunrise service with Davidson Baptist Church and ourselves, um, it will happen again next year. 
So uh, that's already in the books, already being planned. So um, we are looking forward to what God is going to do through that uh, partnership uh, with that church. And uh, also, uh, it was mentioned several times since Easter. Uh, that was good. We need to do it next year. But do we have to wait till next year? Let's do something else in the meantime. So we're already working on something like that uh, with them. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that too. God is just moving and working in that whole situation. So we're, we're blessed. Um, we're going to continue in our series, The Gospel Story. And we are going through the entire Bible. Uh, now, fear not, we're not going line by line because we'd be here for a long, long time. But uh, as we go through an overview of the Bible, we're talking about the three main characters in Scripture. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they are all through Scripture. Many times, um, and it, it has become more in fashion uh, today to uh, not preach about the, uh, preach or even study the Old Testament. Because that's the Old Covenant. And, and there's actually some famous preachers that are saying now we just need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Well, I'm sorry. I'm just old school enough and believe God's word enough that I'm not unhitching from nothing. What's the old song say? Got that old time religion. If it was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. The New Testament church, the only scripture they had was the Old Testament. And then the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. So today, as we move through, starting today, this series is going to pick up speed. Because to get through all of it, we've got to talk really fast and, and hit the high spots, as my grandma would say. But today, we're going to be in a book that I would say most of you, if you've read it and you made it through it, somebody had to shake you and wake you up. When I mention what it is, you're going to probably have to really rack your brain to think about the last time you heard a preacher give a sermon out of the book of Leviticus. Oh, I can see your excitement right now. Most people do not, A, enjoy Leviticus, and from a purely human literary perspective, it can be a little dry. Why? Because in its natural application, it wasn't written to me and you. It was not written to us. Have you ever read something that wasn't written to you? You ever been in a museum or something? They, they've got some famous person, they've written this correspondence to somebody else and and, you know, sometimes they have their old love letters and stuff. We went to the Billy Graham Library, and there's a section where they have some of Ruth and Billy's love letters there. I didn't want to read them. That's between them. That ain't got nothing to do with me. I felt like I was intruding, right? So I was like, uh-uh, I'm not, I'm not reading that. And that's kind of how we come about with Leviticus because it's not written to us. Not at all. However, in its application and in the canon of the entirety of Scripture, there's a lot we can learn. In fact, if you're studying the New Testament and you read the book of Hebrews and you don't read the book of Leviticus, you're missing out. Because to understand Leviticus in our mind and in our day, we've got to read Hebrews. Because what Hebrews did is explain why Leviticus was so important to God's chosen people. I can see you're excited. It's going to get better. As Andy Griffith said, it'll get good or I promise. But as we look at Leviticus, we realize that it was written to God's people and it was written to, it's called Leviticus for a reason, it was written to the Levites. The Levites were the priests. So God had delivered them from Egypt from bondage, from slavery and now he's telling them at the foot of Mount Sinai, Leviticus was written in the scope of a year at the bottom of a mountain. 
And so as God is prescribing the rituals and the rules, the reason he did it is because of what we sang about. He's holy. And God had delivered the people from the bondage, and now he's got to teach them how to relate to a holy God. How unholy people can relate to a holy God. We're still there, by the way. Because of sin, we're not holy. We can't be. Did you know that? But because of Jesus, he puts his righteousness in us and on us, and therefore we can stand before God justified. That big word means just as if I never sinned. And then we get sanctified, set apart, and we can live a holy life that is pleasing to God, and that's how we connect, because of Jesus. But they didn't have Jesus in Leviticus, and so that's why Leviticus was written. This was their manual. This was the the minister's book. But there's a lot in there that helps us to understand. Leviticus 19, and we read this, uh, part of this, just a moment ago. But it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So I've delivered you from bondage, and now I've got a covenant with you. I'm with you, and now you've got to be holy, for I am holy. You shall fear every man his mother and his father and keep my Sabbath. I am the Lord your God. Does verse 3 sound familiar? What's it echo? The Ten Commandments. Turn not unto idols. Sound familiar? Nor make to yourself molten gods, for I am the Lord your God. And if you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, you shall offer it at your own will. And it shall be eaten the same day you offer it, and on the morrow, and if if it ought remain until the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. And if it be eaten at all on the third day, it is an abominable, and it shall not be accepted. Therefore everyone that eateth it shall bear his iniquity, because he hath profaned the hallowed thing of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Boy, that sounds real strict, don't it? And some of y'all are listening to that going, okay. That's wonderful, preacher. I'm blessed. Can we go home now? Because you, you, you're not making the connection. This has nothing to do with you, right? Oh, I never went and made a peace offering. I don't have to. There's significance here because God had to connect his people with him and the way that he did it was through a system of sacrifices. Now listen closely. I'm going to talk fast if you listen fast. There were five sacrifices, sometimes six, prescribed in Leviticus. Okay? So there, were, there was the burnt offering which they offered up when they first came in and that was to excess God's favor provide cleansing. It had to be a young bull. It had to be male. But it could be a turtle dove or a pigeon if they could not afford a bull. Then there was the grain offering. It was flour with olive oil and frankincense. And it was unleavened bread with olive oil. And it was roasted. And then provision for it could be um, eaten by the priest, but it was to set the priests apart. The grain offering was to set them apart and then they ate it. And then there was the sin offering for unintentional sin and that was a young bull in the congregation. It could be, uh, it had to be a male, atonement with blood of the holy place and then it cleansed the congregation from any sin that they committed that they didn't know they committed. Unintentional. Okay? And then there was the graded sin offering for some intentional sins. And this could be a female sheep or goat. And it was for the atonement of confession of sins. So if I messed up, I knew I messed up, I confessed it. Then I had to get a female sheep and sacrifice, take it to the priest. They had to sacrifice it. And that was cleansing of unclean sins. And then there was the guilt offering. 
Oh, by the way, if you didn't have a female sheep, you could use grain, but it had to be a certain portion. And there's so much in here that I could go into, but I'm not going to because you all want to get to eat chicken later. So the guilt offering was if you felt guilty and it was restitution, you had to make up for something you've done, that was a ram, uh, and it was for unintentional or uh, desecration acts, and it was uh, also someone that used God's name or uh, that they had perjured themselves and in court, and this was for forgiveness. And that also, that offering... Um, they had, had a portion of that where they took a goat and they sent him outside the city. They laid their hands on him, the priests, and they confessed all the sins of the people and then they sent him out to get destroyed. And that was called the scapegoat. We use that term today, don't we? Now, what's that got to do with us? Everything. Because when you look at Hebrews, well, first, when you look at Romans... Romans 10.4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. We don't have to do this anymore. Amen? Because Christ fulfilled all of it. Hebrews 9.10-13, it says, And thou shalt anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all his vessels and sanctify the altar, and it shall be an altar most holy. And it's going through all of those things, and I won't take time to read all of those. All the stuff they had to do. But now watch, which stood only in meats and drinks and, and divers' washings and criminal order, or carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So they had to do all that until when? Until Christ. But Christ came and a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of ashes of a heifer sprinkling of the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more? would Jesus do? And then 9.22 through 28, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. And it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the, pa in the heavens, the things before, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So he's talking about the Old Testament. There was times we had to do that, but now we've got a sacrifice from heaven that's better, and his name is Jesus. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that should be offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then we must be often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He put this away from the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that took him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And the church said, Amen. Jesus died and did away with all of that. Now what's that got to do with anything? Everything. The burnt offering was access for God's favor. Jesus did that when he died on the cross. The Passover lamb without spot or blemish. The grain offering that sanctified the priest. Jesus is now our high priest. He sanctified it. We don't need a high priest anymore. Amen. He is that for us. He intercedes for us on our behalf for God, uh, to God. He was the sacrifice. He is the priest. 
Then the peace offering, which we'll get to in a minute. The sin offering for unintentional sin, Jesus covered that. By the way, unintentional sin is not charged a sin until you realize it's a sin. Does that make sense? That's why the Holy Spirit convicts. The law played the, pa played the part of the Holy Spirit because they would read the law and go, oh, wait. They would read Leviticus and go, oh, wait. Well, this is unintentional. I didn't mean to do this, but because I did this, I've got to do this. Well, Jesus covered all that. The guilt offering, what did we say? Though in the presence of God's Holy Spirit, our shame is what? Undone. Romans says, in Christ, therefore, there is no condemnation. Romans 8, 1. We don't have to be guilty anymore. Now, that doesn't mean that sin you will, sin you must. If you don't, you're going to bust and you can't help it. No, the Holy Spirit will help you so that you can live a holy life. Because what did, what did Leviticus say? I am holy, so you must be holy. Well, how do we do that? I'm glad you asked. See, we accept Jesus... They, ex they were delivered from the bondage of Egypt, which is a type of sin. We were delivered from sin, and now we're in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We don't have to do all those offerings anymore, but there's one, one that we talked about, the peace offering. The peace offering. We talked about the peace offering, and that's also called the fellowship offering. Now, what's that got to do with anything? I'm glad you asked. The peace offering was an offering that was given at any time. It was an offering of thanksgiving and it was an offering to show that you wanted to draw closer to God and it was an offering of fellowship. You took it to the priest, you all sat down together, it was a meal. I like this offering. Yeah. A meal together was an act of worship. Amen. And they sat down with him, with the priest. Now, Jesus said that he came to bring peace. In fact, Colossians reminds us that we can have the mind of Christ and the peace of God will guard our heart. The peace offering is Jesus. And when we sit down together and fellowship with one another, and this is an offering that's supposed to draw us close. It's a sanctifying offering. So if we're saved and we love Jesus and we have a portion of God's Spirit living in us when we get saved, then our desire is we want to get closer to Him and become set apart. So how are we holy? Walking with Jesus every day. Romans tells us, now I don't know about you, but when I used to read this in the King James... Oh, it sounded good, sounds very poetic, but it confused me. Because they'd get to verse 2, and they'd just go off. A lot of the preachers I know, nobody that you probably know, but they would go off. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your... By what? The mercies of God. So we're saved. He's saying, brethren, he's talking to Christians, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice... Holy, acceptable unto God. Do we present ourselves every day, say, Lord, I'm yours. Do what you want to do with me. Which is only for people that are really, really saved and serious about it. Is that what it says? It's only for them fanatical folks. It's only for this kind of person. No, that's your reasonable service. That's what you're supposed to do. Do you know we live in a world today that gives awards for stuff you're just supposed to do? Oh, I know you're getting real quiet. I'm sorry, and I'm probably going to hurt some feelings, and you can send your angry cards and letters to me, and I'll read them and throw them away. But... I, I, I have a hard time living in a world where everybody gets a trophy for just showing up. That's what you're supposed to do. If you sign up that you're going to be there, you're supposed to be there. I, 
I mean, there are things that happen. I get that. That's when you call and say, something happened. I can't be there. But don't give me a trophy because doing what I'm supposed to do. I heard a man say this one time, and I, I, I don't mean to, to be crude or anything like that, but he said, in our community, speaking of his particular ethnic background, he said, we want to applaud the men that pay child support and take care of their kids. He said, why? If you have them, you must take care of them. You don't get a trophy. You're not special. It's what you're supposed to do. Right? By the way, the pendulum has swung. Now we got ladies running off too, by the way. I'm not trying to just put it all on the men. It's what you're supposed to do. But the world has made it so irregular and not praised to be just, oh, all you're going to do is, ladies, is stay home and raise your kids? That's, that's awful. No. That's a godly thing, but the world's trying to make it less than. Amen? Giving yourself as a living sacrifice. I know this is a little hard preaching today, but it'll get better, I promise. It's what you're supposed to do. If we love Jesus, then we want to do what Jesus wants us to do, and we should say, Lord, here I am. Now, this is where they would go off the rails where I grew up. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your minds, you may be the simple and perfect will of God. And they'd read that real fast. Because they wanted to hit on, and be not conformed to this world. Oh, you, you don't drink and you don't chew and you don't go with girls that do and you don't need to have a television in your home. Oh, yes, Lord. And you don't need to watch that HBO because that's HBO hell's best offer. That's all that is. That's just modern day Sodom and Gomorrah. And you don't need to have the internet and you don't need to have a computer and you just need to just, just read your Bible every day and don't look at anything and just walk in the store with your head down and don't watch anything and don't be conformed to this world. Amen. Hold up. How are you going to affect the world for good if you don't interact with it? I'm all about don't get into sinful things. By the way, some of them old preachers that used to preach that. Don't be conformed to this world. I never heard them preach one sermon on gluttony. And that was back in the 70s. He wore them buttons, you know, them vests. When them buttons on them, and you couldn't sit in the front row because if they pop one of them bad boys, your eyes are gone. And they would talk about all that stuff, and they'd get fired up. And I'm going to tell you, I saw a lot of hypocrisy in that. I did. Oh, yeah. I'd go to friends' houses where their daddies and mommies preached against TV. They had a TV in the closet they got down for special occasions. That's not what it's talking about. It's not be conformed to the system of this world. It's not individual things. It's the devil's system because he's the prince of the world. So the things that are wrong, that go against God's word, that's what we don't get patterned into. We need to think with a mind that is sanctified and set apart. Amen? Our biggest problem is not trying to avoid natural temptations that are out there and we can see our biggest problem is trying to get rid of the stinking thinking that we hear on the news every day. Or that's being, we're be, our kids are being indoctrinated with at school. Oh, can you handle it? I, I'm going from preaching to meddling in 5-4. Here we go. There's a doctrine today that is straight from the pits of hell that is telling people they're confused they don't know what, you know, they are. That's not true. God made us, and God doesn't make mistakes. Well, why is that so prevalent? Because the, my Bible tells me that God is not the author of confusion. So if God's not, who is? The devil. And if he can get us confused, then we won't get close to God because we think we, there's a God, he, may, he must have made a mistake. So why am I going to serve an imperfect God? Well, there you go. See the lie? We can get conformed into that. Well, that's just their thing. and You know, we just need to hold on. 
But be not conformed to this world, but you've been transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. You want to do the will of God? Renew your mind. Get rid of all that stinking thinking. Now, I've read that a hundred times, probably a thousand, and I get all tangled up with all the wording because it doesn't talk like we talk, you know. It says, I beseech you, I beg you, brethren. Well, look at what J.B. Phillips says. J.B. Phillips says, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship. Get that word? To give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. Isn't that great? Can't you get your mind around that? Because that's what the world's trying to do, squeeze you into their mold. Did you notice they preach tolerance until Christians talk about their God? They want to squeeze, squeeze you into their tolerance, but they're not tolerant of you. Okay, I, I, I'm just going to move on. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice, so that you may do, you'll have right thinking that the plan of God for you is good. It meets all its demands and moves toward the goal of true maturity. You know how you're growing and your mind is being renewed? Because you're becoming more mature in the things of God. Becoming sanctified, right? I want to demonstrate that for you. And I don't want to take, get my snazzy jacket dirty. Hey, this is a very special jacket. It's from another nation, donation. So, uh, when we get saved and God cleanses us, from sin, and we're going to say that this is the Spirit of God, and He fills us with a portion of His Spirit, okay? And it's there, because that's how we know to live. But as we grow, and we keep going, we go daily, that's what a lot of us want to do, you know, we go once a week to church, and we get our little God fix, and, you know, then we wait. But when we do that, when we go back out into the world, what happens is when we're waiting for our next dip, what we had kind of leaks out. What God wants us to do is say, this is no longer mine, my life is yours, so now I want to immerse myself in you and you fill me. And as we're immersed in him, we continually get filled, and as the world around us decays, we, the inner man is being renewed day by day because we stay submerged in his spirit. And when we do that, then we begin to fulfill what is the will of God for all men, which is to be witnesses and women. But then as we do that, then he begins to reveal to us the specific will for our lives. Amen? By the way, many times God's will for your life doesn't always match up originally with what you thought in the beginning. But it won't be something you hate. Because he made you. Why would a God that loves you design you to do something that you would hate? You may not be familiar with it at first. You may not like it at first. But as you begin, you begin to grow, he will fill you, and then you can stand upright in a world that wants to contaminate you. Amen? As we look at all of this, we move toward maturity. Now, um, Caden, do you still have the candy that you brought in here? Or did you eat it all? She's not eating it in church. She ate it outside.
Now, I think, and if I don't have one, I did have one, but it might have fallen out of my pocket. If I don't, I'll give you one later. But uh, I'm going to give you a quarter for a piece of candy. Now, I don't have it, but I'll give it to you. So can I have a piece? Okay. So if I, if I bought this from you, this is now mine, right? Okay. So this is mine. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, he bought us, and we're now his, right? Now, right now, and for those of you that don't know, Caden is like one of my youngins. People mistake her for my kid. Um, that's true. Now, right now, if I gave this back to you, we're almost like family. She'd probably eat it. She's like, no, no deal, no problem. Well, now it's mine. Jesus bought us back. But it, one thing that I do, if I take this candy and I say it's my candy, it's mine for sure, but it's not really mine until this. Now, I've eaten it. Now, because I'm dealing with a teenager, this, this illustration wouldn't, won't work as great because if I were to offer this back to her, she'd say, yeah. But most reasonable people, this is mine now. You don't want it. Why? Because I've ingested it. It's mine. If I had a lollipop, same principle. It's my lollipop, and then when I open it up and I lick it, it's really mine then, right? By the way, remind me next time that I do this illustration to not borrow candy from you. It's a little sour. But you know, sometimes what God asks us to do doesn't always appeal to our flesh. In fact, it never will. But the more I chew this, I like it. It's good. The foreignness, the sourness has washed away and now it's sweet. When we trust God and we become sanctified and set apart, his word is sweet to us. It may hit our flesh a little hard and a little sour sometimes, but when we get it into our spirit, it's sweet. Yeah. So, the thing today that we take away is God is holy. We can do nothing to have fellowship with a holy God except with a relationship through Jesus Christ. And then once we have that relationship, the only thing we do, now there's a teaching today that says, you know, uh, you, you don't have to do anything, you know, salvation is not based on your works. Well, that's partially true. But James says, faith without works is dead. So when we accept Jesus and we have faith in him that he saved us, then he's going to be working on us and as we are set apart, we're going to want to do things for the kingdom because that's going to be the acceptable will of God. God wants everybody to work in his kingdom, the kingdom of God. And Jesus came and said the kingdom is now. It's not far off somewhere. It's right here, right now. Some friends of mine in, o in Newark, Ohio, used to sing a song and said, I'm going to keep on working till he comes, till he comes. There's nothing in this world that's going to turn me around to see. My eyes are on the prize and I'm making it by and by. Oh, I'm going to keep on working till he comes. Mm -hmm. That's me. Keep sanctifying me. Keep setting me apart. Take my life and let it be holy and acceptable unto thee. May we live this week sanctified and set apart not just today but every day and the only way we can do that is through Jesus amen if you're watching today we pray that you would take what God has given and apply it to your life and if you don't know him ask him to come into your life forgive you of your sin confess your sin to him and ask him to come in and change you and make him the Lord of your life every day. Make him the decision maker. Make his word your final authority. And he will change you and transform you. May God bless you.